Good afternoon to uh, those in person and also our Zoom crowd. Um, my name is Eric Bierbaum. I'm faculty director of the Edmund and Lilly Soffer Center for Ethics. And this public lecture is co-sponsored with the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy. And it's my enormous pleasure to introduce Judge Mark Wolf. Judge Wolf was appointed to the Supreme United States District Court for the District of Massachusetts in 1985 and served as its chief judge from 2006 to 2012 and is now a senior judge. Judge Wolf previously served in the Department of Justice as Special Assistant to the Deputy Attorney General of the United States and the Attorney General of the United States as well, and Deputy Attorney States General for the District of Massachusetts and Chief of Public Corruption Unit in that office. Uh, he is the chair of the Integrity Initiative International, an international NGO whose mission is to strengthen the enforcement of criminal laws and to punish and deter leaders who are corrupt and regularly violate human rights. He is also the chair of the John William Ward Public Service Fellowship, the chairman emeritus of the Albert Schweitzer Fellowship, and the past chair of the Judge David S. Nelson Fellowship. Among other honors, Judge Wolf received a certificate of appreciation from President Gerald Ford for his work in the resettlement of Indo-Chinese refugees, an honorary degree from the, Latin, the Boston Latin School, um, and uh, from the Boston chapter of the Federal Bar Association and the Massachusetts Bar Association and the International Conference of Chief, Chief uh, Justices of the World Mother Teresa Award. A graduate of Yale College and Harvard Law School, Judge Wolf has taught courses on the role of the judge in American democracy at Harvard, Boston College, and University of California, Irvine Law Schools. Um, and he has spoken on the role of the judge in democracy uh, in many countries around the world on human rights issues and combating corruption. So please join me in welcoming Judge Wolf. Thank you, uh, Eric, uh, and the uh, Saffer Center for Ethics, and Matthias Risa, uh, the director of the Carr Center, uh, for inviting me here today. Um, uh, somewhat with apologies, because I virtually never do it, I'm going to read a text of my remarks because I want to be precise, but also assure that there's enough time for questions. Uh, but I do appreciate this opportunity to speak to you as an individual and not a representative of the federal judiciary on Supreme Court ethics. Is the court really the least dangerous branch? As Alex Hinder, as Alexander Hamilton famously wrote, in advocating for the adoption of the Constitution in 1978. In 1969, Supreme Court Justice Abe Fortas resigned in response to bipartisan outrage in Congress because he had accepted and subsequently returned a $20,000 consulting fee from a foundation headed by a man being investigated by the Department of Justice and eventually convicted of security fraud. In 1973, four years later, the Judicial Conference of the United States, which is chaired by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, issued a code of conduct for all federal judges except for Supreme Court justices. In November 2023, last year, following mounting demands for Supreme Court ethics reform, the court adopted for the first time a code of conduct stating that the ethics rules and principles that guided Critical comments concerning the code largely focused on the failure to provide a mechanism to enforce it or sanctions for justices who violate it. As I said in testimony in the Senate last year, enforcement of any voluntary code is a major issue. However, that is not, in my view, the greatest defect in the Supreme Court code. That defect is the subtle but significant departure from the ethics statutes enacted to ensure impartiality of the federal judiciary. Those laws govern both federal judges and justices. However, the code includes provisions that either conflict with or exempt the justices from these stat statutory obligations. In other words, through its adoption of the code, the Supreme Court has essentially asserted the power, if not the right, not to obey laws enacted by Congress and the president. Thus, the code undermines the system of checks and balances that safeguard our constitutional democracy, threatens the impartiality of the Supreme Court, 
and jeopardizes crucial public confidence in the federal judiciary. The issues I'm discussing today can be best understood in the context of the constitutional architecture of the federal government. As many, but perhaps not all of you know, the United States Constitution is fundamentally based on Lord Acton's observation that power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. To reduce this risk, the powers of the federal government are divided between three branches, the legislature, the Congress, the executive, the president, and the judiciary, the courts. The three branches of government are not separate silos. The Supreme Court itself has squarely rejected the argument that the Constitution contemplates a complete division of authority between the three branches. Rather, they are intended to provide essential checks and balances to each other. For example, generally no law can be enacted without the approval of both Congress and the President. As I said earlier, in 1788, Alexander Hamilton wrote that the judiciary would always be the least dangerous branch because the president had military power and the courts would have to rely on the executive to enforce its judgments. In addition, Congress would be more powerful than the courts because it controlled spending. And Hamilton wrote, prescribes the rules and the duties by which, I'm sorry, prescribes the rules by which the duties and rights of every citizen are to be regulated. Hamilton argued that although the Constitution does not provide it, the courts must necessarily have the power to declare that statutes enacted by Congress and the President are invalid in order to assure that elected officials do not exercise power not given to them by the people in the Constitution. To perform this important role without fear of retribution for their inevitable unpopular decisions, federal judges would have life tenure and not be subject to election. In this way, the Constitution created an independent judiciary. However, the independence of the judiciary is not an end in itself. Every United States justice and judge takes an oath to administer justice without respect to persons and do equal right to the poor and to the rich and to faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all of the duties of his or her office. As this oath reflects, it is the most fundamental duty of every justice and judge to decide cases impartially without fear or favor. As I learned in Slovakia years ago, an independent judiciary is not necessarily an impartial judiciary. It could be a dishonest, unaccountable judiciary. Therefore, there must be means of determining whether a justice or judge is capable of deciding a particular case impartially, and whether reasonable, well-informed people can be confident that he or she is doing so. There must also be means of holding justices and judges accountable if they violate laws intended to ensure that they decide cases honestly and impartially. There are several statutes that have been enacted to do this. As is well known, accepting or soliciting a bribe is a federal crime. Perhaps less well known is the statute that prohibits justices and judges from soliciting or accepting anything of value from a person whose interests may be substantially affected by the performance of his or her official duties. However, there are two other statutes that are central to what I'm discussing today. They are laws intended to assure that justices and judges decide cases impartially without injuring their independence in doing so. One statute, 28 United States Code Section 455, provides that a justice or judge must disqualify himself or herself if he or she is biased or prejudiced, or if a reasonable person might question his or her impartiality in a particular case even if the justice or judge is not actually biased or prejudiced. In part to ensure that litigants and the public have the information necessary to be confident that a justice or judge is capable of performing impartially in a particular case, the 1978 Ethics and Government Act 
requires that all federal officials, including justices and judges, make certain financial disclosures annually. Willfully making a false statement in a financial disclosure report or willfully failing to report required information is a crime punishable by up to five years in prison. As I indicated earlier, in 1973, the Judicial Conference promulgated a code of conduct for United States judges. A federal judge can be sanctioned by the judiciary for violating the code. However, as I also indicated earlier, the Supreme Court justices are not subject to that code, and until November 2023, we're not subject to any code at all. The Code of Conduct for United States Judges, but not justices, states that a judge should respect and comply with the law and should act at all times in a manner that promotes public confidence in the judiciary. As required by one of the related statutes, Section 455A, that code states that a judge shall disqualify himself or herself in a proceeding in which the judge's impartiality might reasonably be questioned. Also as required by Section 455B, the code states that a judge shall disqualify himself if he knows that his spouse has an interest that could be substantially affected by the outcome of the proceeding. In 2011 and 2012, six complaints were made to the Judicial Conference and the Supreme Court that Justice Clarence Thomas had for multiple years failed to report, as required by the Ethics and Government Act, that his wife, Ginny Thomas, had been employed by the Heritage Foundation a conservative think tank, and was paid a total of almost $700,000. As I testified in the Senate last year, the Ethics and Government Act required the Judicial Conference to decide if there was reasonable cause to believe that the justice, who had reported his wife's employment for many previous years, had willfully, falsely stated that she had none in the years that she worked for and was paid by the Heritage Foundation. If reasonable cause to believe the false statements were made willfully was found to exist, the law required that the conference refer the justice to the Attorney General for possible investigation and prosecution. However, Justice Thomas was allowed to file amended reports and the matter was closed without the 24 members of the Judicial Conference, including me, being informed of the complaints concerning his possible criminal conduct. The revelations concerning Justice Thomas prompted members of the Senate Judiciary Committee, among others, to urge the Supreme Court to subject itself to the code of conduct applicable to all other federal judges in order to increase public trust and confidence in the court. In his 2011 year-end report on the federal judiciary, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote that a code of conduct for Supreme Court justices was not necessary or appropriate, in part because the justices, like all other federal judges, file statutorily required financial disclosure reports annually. He also noted that the justices are subject to Section 455, the statute requiring a justice's recusal, meaning disqualification, in certain circumstances. However, he wrote, the principles of recusal can differ due to the unique circumstances of the Supreme Court. The Chief Justice concluded that his colleagues were jurists of exceptional integrity and therefore a code of conduct for them was not needed. Issues concerning the integrity of uh, justices and the need for a Supreme Court code of conduct reemerged with intensity last year. The Ethics and Government Act requires the annual reporting of gifts received by a justice and his or her spouse, except for gifts received as personal hospitality. The statute defines personal hospitality as hospitality extended for, the non for a non-business purpose by an individual at the personal residence of that individual or property or facility owned by him or his family. The paradigm for personal hospitality 
is dinner at the house of friends or perhaps a weekend at their beach house. The statutory definition of personal hospitality does not include travel paid for by someone else. That travel in the individual or organization that paid for it must, like gifts, be reported annually. Among other things, in 2023, ProPublica, a nonprofit media organization, reported that Justice Thomas had failed to report many gifts from billionaires, including 38 vacations, 26 private flights, and stays at luxury resorts in Florida and Jamaica. ProPublica also wrote that Harlan Crow, a wealthy real estate developer and contributor to conservative causes and Republicans, had paid for some of Justice Thomas's vacations including on a yacht in Indonesia, and purchased from the justice his mother's home. The New York Times reported that uh, a man named Anthony Welters forgave a substantial amount of a loan that Justice Thomas had used to buy a quarter million dollar motor coach. None of these matters were reported on the justice's financial disclosure reports <laughs> as gifts or otherwise as required by the Ethics in Government Act. In addition, ProPublica reported last year that in 2008, Justice Samuel Alito went for free on a fishing trip to Alaska arranged by Leonard Leo, the head of the Conservative Federalist Society and other advocacy organizations. Justice Alito flew for free on a private jet of a hedge fund billionaire whose businesses reportedly had matters in the Supreme Court whose businesses repeatedly had matters in the Supreme Court. The, justices, the justice stayed for free for three days at a commercial fish, fishing lodge that charged more than $1,000 a day. It was owned by a wealthy donor to conservative causes. Justice Alito did not report these payments as gifts or travel expenses on his financial disclosure report as the law required. <clears throat> Justices Thomas and Alito were not the only justices whose conduct raised ethical issues. Justices Sonia Sotomayor and Neil Gorsuch each received advances and royalties from Random House for books they published, yet neither recused themselves from deciding whether the Supreme Court should hear cases in which Random House was a party. We know this because the payments from Random House were disclosed in their financial disclosure reports. Similarly, former Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg reported being provided transportation, food, and lodging in 2018 by an Israeli billionaire whose companies previously had business before the Supreme Court. The revelations concerning Justice Thomas particularly prompted the chair of the Senate Judiciary Committee and others to call on Chief Justice Roberts to investigate the alleged misconduct and to subject the Supreme Court to an ethical code. The chair indicated that he would seek to have Congress create a code for the court by statute if the Supreme Court did not itself act. The Chief Justice declined an invitation to testify on the matter. However, as I said, in November 2023, the Supreme Court adopted a code of conduct. The code states that justice should respect and comply with the law and set and act at all times in a manner that promotes public confidence in the integrity and impartiality of the judiciary. The law, of course, includes Section 455, the statute that requires a justice not participate in a case in certain circumstances. However, the Supreme Court's code does not reaffirm that statutory mandate. Rather, it undermines it. The statute unambiguously states that any justice, judge, or magistrate judge of the United States shall disqualify himself in any proceeding in which his impartiality might reasonably be questioned. It also states that he shall disqualify himself in five specific circumstances. As the Supreme Court has unremarkably written, the word shall in a statute normally creates an obligation impervious to judicial discretion. Therefore, shall means must. 
The code, however, states that a justice should disqualify himself or herself in a proceeding in which the justice's impartiality might reasonably be questioned. It also, it also uses the term should concerning the counterparts of circumstances in which the statute requires recusal, including, for example, when the justice's spouse has an interest in the subsequent in the subject matter of the controversy or in a party to the proceeding or any other interest that could be substantially affected by the outcome of the proceeding. Again, unremarkably, courts have interpreted the word should to mean something's discretionary, not mandatory. Therefore, the code gives a justice the discretion to participate in deciding a case when the law enacted by Congress and the president requires his or her disqualification. In addition, the code provides exception to the statutory standards for disqualification with the potential to undermine the purpose of the code. For example, it states that the rule of necessity may override the rule of disqualification. This rule, created by the Supreme Court, authorizes a justice to exercise his or her discretion to participate in a case well and to participate in a case in which the statute requires his or her disqualification the rationale for this departure from the law is that every justice is indispensable however the supreme court at times must and does function with only eight justices sometimes a justice recuses herself as justice katanji brown jackson did in a case argued this January. Sometimes there is a vacancy, as there was for the 18 months after Justice Antonin Scalia died in 2016. The Supreme Court has the right to propose that Congress and the President amend Section 455 to create an exception for it. The court would also have the power, although not necessarily the right, to find the statute unconstitutional if the issue were presented in a case before it. However, the code authorizes justices to simply ignore the statute without doing either. The code also creates another significant exception to the statutory requirements of Section 455 by providing that neither the filing of a brief amicus curiae nor the participation of counsel for amicus curiae requires a justice's disqualification. An amicus is an individual or entity that is not a party to a case, but is allowed to make an argument in support of a party. The commentary to the code states, the courts of appeals follow a similar approach to ameliorating any risk that an amicus filing could precipitate a recusal. It cites Federal Rule of Appellate Procedure 29A2 as authority for this proposition. Actually, however, the Courts of Appeals approach is diametrically opposite from the Supreme Court's. Rule 29 does not permit an appellate judge to sit in a case where Section 455 requires disqualification based on the participation of an amicus. Rather, the rule requires that the amicus not be allowed to participate in the case so the judge can do so lawfully. Moreover, the commentary to the code states that individual justices, rather than the court, decide issues of recusal. The code does not require a justice to disclose possible grounds for recusal to other justices, the litigants, or the public. Rather, exceptions to the Section 455 statutory duty to recuse based on necessity or exceptions, I'm sorry, rather exceptions to the Section 455 statutory duty to recuse based on necessity or on the amicus exception created by the Supreme Court are authorized to be made secretly by a single justice. Therefore, the code permits what the Washington Post reported occurred in 2012. Reportedly, Leonard Leo, instructed a Republican pollster, Kellyanne Conway, to bill a nonprofit group he advised, the Judicial Education Project, $25,000 for purported 
polling and consulting because he wanted to give Justice Thomas's wife, Ginny, another $25,000. He emphasized that the paperwork should have no mention of Ginny, of course. Conway sent the requested bill to Leo and evidently gave the $25,000 supplement to Justice Thomas's wife. The same year, the Judicial Education Project filed an amicus brief in a landmark Supreme Court voting rights case, Shelby County versus Holder. Justice Thomas participated and was part of the 5-4 majority that invalidated a provision of the law intended to protect minority voters as Leo's organization had advocated. If Mrs. Thomas did little or no work for the Judicial Education Project, any payments to her should have been disclosed as a gift on Justice Thomas's 2012 financial disclosure report, which was due to be filed in May 2012 before the Shelby County case was decided in June 2013. If the payments had been disclosed by Justice Thomas in 2012, or in his financial disclosure report for that year, the Department of Justice could have decided whether to investigate the payments to Mrs. Thomas as a possible bribe. However, if it were then in effect, the Supreme Court's current code would have permitted Justice Thomas to decide, without informing his colleagues or the litigants, that his participation in the case was necessary, even if a fully informed, reasonable person might have questioned his impartiality, and therefore his recusal was required by the statute. The fact that the Supreme Court Code of Conduct implicitly reflects the view that the justices are not required to obey laws concerning ethics enacted by Congress and the President is consistent with the position recently expressed by Justice Alito. In a July 2023 lengthy Wall Street Journal interview by David Rifkin, an attorney in a case then before the Supreme Court, Justice Alito stated explicitly that the justices do not have to obey the laws enacted by Congress because, and I quote, no provision in the Constitution gives them the authority to regulate the Supreme Court, period. This statement is revolutionary. The Supreme Court unequivocally stated almost 150 years ago that no man in this country is so high that he is above the law. In an actual case, an ethics statute could be held to be an unconstitutional incursion on the independence of the judiciary. But according to the Supreme Court's jurisprudence, only if the statute unduly prevents the courts from accomplishing their constitutionally assigned functions. As I said earlier, the core constitutional function of the courts is to decide cases impartially. The Ethics in Government Act and the related recusal statute are intended to promote rather than impede the proper performance of that core function. It's anomalous for Justice Alito to assert that Congress and the President do not have the power to enact legislation concerning judicial ethics because no provision of the Constitution provides that power. As I said earlier, no provision of the Constitution gives the Supreme Court the power to hold statutes unconstitutional. Justice Alito's view would mean that judges could not be prosecuted or punished for accepting bribes. The judiciary would not be subject to any of the checks and balances. If the Supreme Court adopts Justice Alito's position and holds that the statutes concerning judicial ethics are unconstitutional in an actual case, it will have made the least dangerous branch the most dangerous branch. As Harvard Law School professor Emeritus Alan Dershowitz has succinctly stated, our system of governments is based on separation of powers and checks and balances. The judiciary is an independent branch, but is not like it is not, but it, like other branches, is subject to the checks. 
Unlike the legislative and executive branches, the judicial branch is not subject to the ultimate check in any democracy, namely periodic elections. That makes, this makes it even more important that justices be subject to the legislative check of compelled ethical rules and the executive check of prosecution for violation of those rules. However, Justice Alito's view is already being cited to frustrate the Senate's ability to investigate some of the incidents I've mentioned and get information concerning whether new judicial ethics laws should be enacted. The Senate Judiciary Committee authorized uh, subpoenas for Leonard Leo and Harlan Crow. Leo has resisted providing the requested documents and information. His attorney, David Rifkin, who interviewed Justice Alito, has asserted that Congress has no power to investigate because any ethics legislation Congress might enact would be, as Justice Alito said, unconstitutional. Harlan Crow has taken the same position. Therefore, the Supreme Court may soon have to decide the merits of Justice Alito's contention. This would raise the question of whether his July 2023 statement that Congress has no power to legislate concerning the Supreme Court was inconsistent with the Supreme Court's current prohibition on commenting on the merits of an impending case. It would also raise the question of whether Justice Alito must recuse himself in any such case for having prejudged it. In an opinion piece Justice Alito published in June 2023, he stated that his failure to disclose in his 2008 financial disclosure report who paid for his flight and accommodations on the free Alaskan fishing, tr fishing trip was consistent with the standard practice of the justices. There's reason to believe this may be true. However, I hope you will tell me whether the recent revelations about any such practice injures your confidence in the integrity and impartiality of Supreme Court justices and indeed all federal judges. This is a crucial question. As Hamilton wrote, judges do not have an army to enforce what may be unpopular or controversial orders. Rather, rather we really rely on the confidence of the American people that these decisions have been made impartially in their insistence that they be obeyed. As Chief Justice Roberts wrote in 2022, public trust is essential, not incidental, to our function. It took a long time for that trust to develop, and it may not be enduring. In 1803, in the seminal case of Marbury versus Madison, Chief Justice John Marshall declared that the courts had the power to order President Thomas Jefferson to deliver a judicial commission signed by his president, predecessor, President John Adams. Marshall also held that the courts could invalidate as unconstitutional the law authorizing the trial he had conducted as a Supreme Court justice. Marshall, though, did not order Jefferson to deliver the commission because he knew that Jefferson would refuse to comply and that the American people would support their newly elected president rather than an unelected Supreme Court justice. In 1861, President Abraham Lincoln ignored with impunity the first Supreme Court order to a president, a directive to release a prisoner during the Civil War. However, in 1974, the Supreme Court ordered President Richard Nixon to obey a grand jury subpoena for tapes he secretly made of conversations in the Oval Office that incriminated him and his close colleagues concerning many crimes in what came to be known as Watergate. President Nixon knew that by then, the American people had great confidence in the Supreme Court, would be outraged by defiance of its order, and he would be impeached and removed from office if he did not comply. Therefore, he turned over the tapes and resigned. Confidence in the Supreme Court is now waning. Last year, Pew and Gallup polls showed that public confidence in the Supreme Court was at a historic, historic low. This diminished confidence is undoubtedly attributable in part 
to some of the Supreme Court's controversial decisions. For example, in 2010, the court decided five to four in Citizens United that corporations, labor unions, and mega donors can make unlimited contributions to what became uh, political action committees that support candidates for office. This year, the Supreme Court may make another controversial decision. It will, if, it will have to decide whether to reverse the 40-year-old Chevron Doctrine that requires courts to defer to an agency's reasonable interpretation of an ambiguous statute. The demise of Chevron could, among other things, result in the invalidation of environmental regulations and thus financially benefit real estate developers and others. As these examples indicate, it is extremely important that reasonable people be assured that controversial decisions are being made impartially and are not improperly influenced by, among other things, wealthy people who have partisan political or personal agendas and who secretly provide lavish gifts to some of the justices. There are now efforts to enact legislation intended to promote public confidence in the judiciary. For example, the Senate Judiciary Committee has sent to the full Senate a Supreme Court Ethics Recusal and Transparency Act sponsored by Senator Sheldon Whitehouse. If adopted, the act would require the Supreme Court to increase transparency by adopting rules governing the disclosure of gifts, travel and income received by justices and their families that are as rigorous as those that apply to members of Congress, establish rules requiring each party or amicus to disclose anything of value provided to a justice, and require justices to explain their recusal decisions to the public. In the current intensely partisan political environment, the prospects for any legislation are poor. For principled and pragmatic reasons, I, re I agree with the Supreme Court Code that judges must bear the primary responsibility for acquiring appropriate judicial behavior. That code properly provides that in performing the duties of his or her office, a justice should not be swayed by partisan interests, public clamor, or fear of criticism. However, justices and judges should not be indifferent I say, justices and judges should not be indifferent to informed, legitimate, serious concerns about their integrity and impartiality. It is important that we, as justices and judges, at all times choose to act and are seen to act in a manner that demonstrates to the American people that we are faithfully and impartially administering justice equally to the poor and to the rich, as we have taken an oath to do. It is, as it's primarily the responsibility of judges to foster appropriate judicial behavior and thus encourage public confidence in the courts, I again thank uh, the Edmund and Lilly Saffer Center for Ethics and the Carr Center for Human Rights Policy for giving me this opportunity to speak to you today and to respond to any questions you have that I as a judge can appropriately answer. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Judge Wolf. And we have both an online audience uh, and an in-person audience. So we'll be mixing the two in. Uh, who'd like to start? Great. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from online uh, from Gabe Roth. Um, if you were king for a day, which of these accountability measures for SCOTUS would you implement? And it can't be more than one. Could you speak a little more loudly, please? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you were king for a day, which of these accountability measures for SCOTUS would you implement? And it can be more than one. Uh, one is an inspector general which could receive info on misconduct from the public and write reports publicizing them to a similar regime as the Judicial Conduct and Disability Act, 
but with, say, a judicial counsel of the chief circuit judges adjudicating misconduct complaint complaints. Three, an internal SCOTUS ethics office that urges the justices to comply with the code section 445, or 455, sorry. Four, withholding some SCOTUS funding until the justices implement their own accountability measures. I believe that Mr. Roth has done a great deal of work in this area because if I'm not mistaken, having read some of his uh, writings recently, he's the head of Fix the Courts, and he must uh, revel in the opportunity to give an order to a judge, just one. Uh, uh, if I may be in contempt of the order, I'd say the following. First, uh, and, and I have a litany of other measures that I could put on his list, uh, statutory measures. Um, I think the most important thing that could be done is not on that list, and that's requiring maximum transparency of what's going on. Justice Louis Brandeis, uh, whose portrait hangs over my desk uh, in the courthouse in Boston, said, uh, sunshine is the best disinfectant. And I think that uh, if there's uh, exposure of what's being done, uh, then it will discourage people from doing things they might be tempted to do, but wouldn't want others to know about. Uh, that's one. Two, uh, I think uh, that of that uh, menu Mr. Roth provided, and I may be the only judge in the country who believes this, uh, Senator Grassley has ardently argued for uh, decades, uh, I think the judiciary uh, would benefit from having an inspector general as uh, Congress and all the executive branch agencies are required to have. Uh, and I assume that the inspector general will be selected by the judiciary and would not be some crazy person. Uh, but uh, again, you need a check and a balance. But the, the, the corollary, in my view, to this increased transparency is a shift in a cultural paradigm. I, I, I said earlier that I learned in Slovakia when I was doing work there for our ambassador long ago uh, that an independent judiciary is not necessarily an impartial judiciary because follow, following the collapse of the Soviet Union, they adopted a constitution that created an independent judiciary. It happened to be headed by uh, a dishonest, possibly corrupt judge who punished his colleagues and there was nothing uh, under the constitution that could apparently lawfully be done about him. And it, it, that's what brought into short focus for me, that the goal is not independence, it's impartiality. And for, our, for we lower court judges, there are a variety of things that hold us accountable. We have to conduct open proceedings. The Supreme Court, though, doesn't permit us to broadcast our proceedings. The state courts can do it. Uh, my decisions, when, if I'm asked to recuse myself, uh, can be appealed to a higher court. The Supreme Court doesn't have that. Uh, they're final. Uh, and uh, these financial disclosure statutes I talked about in Slovakia and elsewhere around the world, uh, you know, create opportunities uh, for people to see whether a judge might be improperly influenced, and therefore I think an incentive for judges to avoid that. Uh, but I, I come back, uh, Mr. Roth, it, it really requires uh, a culture. This is what I said in Slovakia. I mean, the, it's a great honor to be a federal judge. Uh, and I said, I don't want to disappoint my colleagues. Very few have been committed, uh, convicted of committing crimes in the history of the Republic. Uh, and. I don't want to disappoint my colleagues and tarnish my office. And I don't think anybody aspires to become a Supreme Court justice so he or she can hobnob with billionaires on yachts 
and not have to pay anything. I think people go into public service because they know, uh, or this form of public service, because the role of the courts is vitally important in our democracy. But something happens apparently, arguably, uh, in the Supreme Court where uh, Justice Alito would say, this is a standard practice. And I think the best hope would be uh, not to just treat this issue as a partisan issue. When I testified about what happened in 2012 in the Judicial Conference last year, I was accused by two Republican senators of being a woke, noxious, woke, left-wing judge uh, abetting a witch hunt. There may be partisan motives that some people have, but you know, regular American people uh, are disturbed, uh, and many of my colleagues are disturbed uh, by the recent revelations concerning the Supreme Court. And the best way to deal with that is for the Supreme Court to be concerned about its own legitimacy and uh, concerned about whether people will continue to accept their decisions as legitimate peacefully rather than react to them violently. But if, some, if one of your three is necessary, I think the best hope would be an inspector general. Matthias Reese. Thank you for this very insightful talk. Um, I, you know, completely agree on the egregious egregiousness of these various episodes that you were talking about. But I was also um, getting hung, hung up a little bit on something that you said at the end about the impartial administration of justice on behalf of rich and poor. I think these were the words you used. You know, to impartial to all these various groups, and it made me think of a really interesting political science literature about the relationship between policy preferences of different socioeconomic groups and what's actually happening in, in the legislative process. And what we find there, it's actually it is genuinely shocking, right? That And uh, the gist of that is, uh, if, there is a if, if there is a divergence between the policy preferences of the, the bottom, whatever, 70% and the higher ups, uh, you know, they're not the same anyway, which they often aren't. And then the, the policy preferences of the bottom 70% don't matter at all for what's happening in legislation. Uh, and so this is about legislation. And then there's some interesting discussion about why is that, right? And probably has something to do with access, who, you know, campaign financing and who, you know, who gets to be in the same room. But, you know, it also has presumably a lot to do with uh, who is in who is in parliament, who is in Congress in the first place, social origins, right? How you see the world, right? The perspective that you that you have. So um, so none of this is directly about the judicial branch, but of course one wonders. Yeah. So how the this kind of result applies to the judicial branch. So of course in Clarence, Tom in Clarence Thomas's case, we have these, <clears throat> these uh, you know, these these uh, egregious things happening. Clarence Thomas also comes from very humble origins in in Georgia, and he has seen the United States over many decades in ways in which rarely anybody else in the in the court ever has. But it makes me wonder a little bit in terms of that statement that you made at the end. So, is there? And you said it's a it's a question of culture. Do do judges have a culture, or shouldn't judges have a culture to be exposed to the country in a in a not just your law school circles, you know, not just your social circles, but you know, so that they actually this administration of justice for rich and poor are there? Shouldn't there be mechanisms? beyond the egregious cases of corruption to get judges to see the world broadly? Well, well I think uh, while over the years there have been examples of judges uh, not doing what's, not reporting what's required by the Ethics and Government Act, you don't, you haven't seen revelations comparable to what's going on in the Supreme Court that relate to the Supreme Court with regard to lower court judges. And in, in my experience, almost 39 years as a federal judge, my colleagues are honorable. We, it's just natural to think, gee, if this was on the front page of the paper, how would I feel about it? 
and not do it if, if you wouldn't feel good about it. Uh, and, uh, you know, the Supreme Court epitomizes and personifies the, the federal courts for most people. So distrust of the Supreme Court, I think, is also reflected in the polls that show diminishing trust in all of the federal courts. And it's a very unfortunate actually dangerous thing because we rely on people to accept deeply disappointing decisions peacefully. And uh, uh, we can only do that if they believe that those decisions are principled, not partisan, not influenced. The, the, the oath we take is to do equal justice to the rich and to the poor. And you know, the, the, the rich... Uh, maybe very rich, but you know they're usually outnumbered. I mean, this is part of why you know. I think everybody. When I used to teach this, I'd ask my students, "How many of you feel you're part of a minority, or in the minority?" They all did for different reasons. One might be female, one might be Asian, but you know, it's a lot of minorities, and, and there are times when you, we make. Uh, decisions that favor rich people at the expense of poor people, but that's what the law requires. Um, and as long as everybody, I mean, it, it, it is a generic, a related issue. Congress is unduly influenced uh, by money, which Citizens United uh, really un unleashed uh, the grave, perhaps realized risk of. Uh, you know, people who don't trust any institution. But I know a lot of my colleagues, as well as I, uh, work very hard to try to demonstrate there's at least one branch of government that performs the way it's supposed to, honestly, honorably, and deserves respect. Um, and I think, you know, there are justices. Some of the justices, most people would say, could do better. In, that's my hope. Judge Wolf, I want to ask, in your lecture, you left open the possibility that an ethics code for the Supreme Court could uh, be unconstitutional under certain conditions. And I wonder what that might look like. What, what, would it be overly intrusive? What would be the features of it that could lead it to be um, too hands-on, perhaps? Um, I suppose, well, they, they, they can give you a... Uh, uh, Hypothetical. That's not. Uh, that's not plausible. If the Supreme Court said, uh, uh, for example, uh, no African American person could judge a case involving another African American person, that uh, that might uh, be. Well, I think that would be unconstitutional, probably. Uh, that case won't come before me. That case won't come before anybody, I hope. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a delicate uh, balance. The, uh, um, you know, and, and there probably are others. But in the current uh, environment, I don't think we're going to see any legislation on anything. And the, the threat to the court and its legitimacy and its authority is not coming uh, from Congress I, uh, or legislation. I think it's really a risk that uh, the, the court is suffering from self-inflicted wounds. And it's not every justice, uh, but they would have, you know, the. The Congress, Congress is restrained. They, the, the, the Senate Judiciary Committee invited uh, Chief Justice Roberts to appear, and he declined. And he pointed out that rarely in history of Chief Justices or any justices uh, appeared in the Senate because there's a sense of comedy, but there's I think also a sense of intimidation. Uh, maybe Congress is timid. Uh, because they're accused of being partisan. Uh, but some, like Senator Whitehouse, are tenacious about this. 
And the, the media plays a very important role in this. As I said, you know, sunshine's the best disinfectant. How do we know these things that weren't reported uh, that uh, should have been? Uh, and we know it because we have an energetic, uh, often fearless uh, media. Although they may be in more jeopardy soon because uh, in contrast to most of the world, our judicially crafted libel laws uh, make it very hard to win, a, if you're a public official, to win a libel case. That's, that's not true in Slovakia. It's not true in the United Kingdom. Uh, and it can pose overwhelming costs just to get sued, even if you win the case, even if what you said was true. Uh, but I think the media is important, and all of these, you know, each branch kind of usually defers to the other. The Supreme Court's unique because it, if it gets a case, it's got the last word on everything. It's, Justice Robert Jackson said, we're not, in, we're not final because we're infallible. We're infallible because we're final. <laughs> uh, so they, they really, you know, if, if, if there's concern at the Supreme Court about these matters, uh, then they should find a way to do better themselves. I think the code, obviously, from what I said, could and should be much stronger, uh, but there are other ways too. Frank, and we'll go to Chad. Uh, uh, lapse of public confidence in Thank you. Uh, lapse of public confidence in the Supreme Court is a very real phenomenon uh, in the American Republic today, and it's a very serious problem for the American Republic. I, I think that. Um, Could you uh, tell people who you are? This is somebody who's been teaching me for 60 years. Go ahead. <laughs> my, my, my question, uh, I think, I'll, let me put the question this way. Um, do you think that suspicion on the part of Americans, you know, across, uh, uh, across the board, suspicion that the justices are on the take do you think that that's a leading cause of the decline of public confidence in the court, or do you think that the causes might lie that the causes significant part elsewhere? Well, I, I think it's a significant part of the cause, and the two are related. Uh, when the Supreme Court overturns Roe versus Wade, people who are ardently, uh, uh, I don't know what you call it, uh, uh, pro-abortion, but in that camp, uh, don't accept it as legitimate, uh, in part, now it's not only that they don't like it, it's that they fear it's not a principal decision. It's not really rooted in the law. And you know, that's a hard case. Uh, Archibald, Professor Archibald Cox, who taught me constitutional law at Harvard Law School decades ago and was President John F. Kennedy, a Democrat solicitor general, was among those who was very critical of Roe versus Wade when it was enacted as not rooted in uh, some specific guarantee in the Constitution. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, 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 these are serious legal issues. Uh, but I do think that uh, when there's the perception that judges or justices are essentially political figures uh, making decisions based on the partisan interests of people, uh, who've, inf you know, who've entertained them, sometimes lavishly, often secretly, uh, it undermines that confidence. So I think it's organic. Yeah. Chad. Um, thanks. Uh, I, with respect to the notion of influence, and just following on from this question, I was 
thinking as an outsider about um, highly partisan judge judgments that might be made and how that may overdetermine what they do such that they may claim, perhaps not credibly, but they may claim that um, the financial benefits they received were not, did not make any difference. They were going to judge in a particular way all along due to certain ideological um, background. I just wanted to hear. Yeah. Um, but that's why the recusal yeah. statute says that we can't, you, you can't sit if you're biased or prejudiced. You know, if your wife's a party to the case, you're uh, under the code, under the statute, you have to recuse yourself. But we're also required to recuse ourselves if a reasonable person might question our impartiality. Uh, and things are different for justices. They say, well, you know, there's only nine of us. If Judge Wolf disqualifies himself, another judge can sit. It, it, they're not totally black and white issues. But it's, it's vital that people have confidence uh, in the impartiality, the honesty, the integrity of judicial decisions. And public opinion can make a big difference. I, I thought Professor Michaelman was going to say to me, uh, these issues are not new. Uh, in, the, in the 1930s, a, a very conservative judicial act of its Supreme Court was finding unconstitutional much of Franklin Roosevelt's progressive legislation to try to ameliorate the conditions uh, in the Depression. And then there was discussion, as there is again, well, of court packing. We should appoint more justices. Quite a political, potentially partisan move. But it was serious. Uh, it, it might have happened. And then on a key case, the Supreme Court, departing from its recent practice, essentially ruled in favor of President Roosevelt, and it, 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 it was said at the time, a switch in time saved nine. So there, you know, you're not going to get legislation, but none of us lives in a bubble that's impervious. And, and that's why I try to state this carefully. Judges absolutely should not uh, be timid about making uh, uh, decisions based on the facts and the law that are unpopular. I was the first, I might still be the only judge who ever ordered a sex reassignment se surgery case for a transsexual prisoner who was serving a life sentence uh, for murdering his wife. It was foreseeably controversial. Uh, but it was legally required in my view. Uh, and and while people could say terrible things about me, you know, I could, couldn't be removed from office or sent to Wyoming because I did it. That's our constitution. Um, but uh, but we do really we shouldn't be indifferent to serious concerns that are not partisan concerns. They're concerns about regular people. When I testified in the Senate last year. And, uh, there's a Washington Post column the next day uh, about how I was smeared and the first senator to do it walked out before I could say anything, made all kinds of unfounded and unfair allegations about me and walked out. Uh, but we, you know, I was asked, they ended by saying, you know, because people say to me, why are you doing this? And I had with me my friend uh, Jim O'Connell, the founder of Boston Healthcare for the Homeless, who's got a young uh, child, say, what am I going to say to her about the Supreme Court? Uh, and I had with me my law clerks uh, uh, who volunteered to work on this. Uh, because young people come into the profession, they're very idealistic, and, and they, you know, ex ex especially expect judges to be uh, uh, people 
uh, and officials to be respected uh, uh, and that they can trust. And I also had with me a young man named Grigory Vipen. I met him 10 years ago when he was getting a master's degree at Harvard Law School. Uh, brilliant long, young lawyer from Russia. He uh, went back to bring American public interest uh, lawyering techniques to Russia. He was representing Memorial, which won the Nobel Peace Prize uh, when he was designated a spy by the FSB. And uh, he'll actually be at Harvard Law School next month. We were able to get him a uh, fellowship uh, in Washington that's ending now. So we wouldn't have to go back to Russia uh, where he would have been uh, imprisoned, undoubtedly. Uh, and, you know, there are people all over the world who are inspired by the ideal of the American judge. I have very good friends I was working with in Turkey uh, who were in prison the day after the attempted coup in 2016. They were working to try to make the judiciary more expert, more independent, more impartial. Uh, and 2,800 of them got locked up. And some of them, you know, colleagues and I have been helping, trying to help uh, one of them may be watching on Zoom. Uh, the, there are people inspired by this example. Whenever I come back from my international travel, it would have been a long list if Eric had read all of it. I always come back with a heightened uh, uh, sense of uh, gratitude for the opportunity to be an honest, impartial judge in the United States and a heightened sense of responsibility to do it for all of these other people. But uh, people abroad who take great risks to be like they think we are in the way we should be. Yes. This is kind of like on a different note, but I'm curious to what extent you believe that, um, so the court's perception or uh, I guess general public mistrust in the court is is increasing and largely that's because of um, perceived kickbacks or um, corrupt action, but it's also related to ideal the the um, uh, the idea that in, individuals are viewing the court more and more as a political body. So to what extent do you think that that kind of perception broadly is irreparable? Um, and and uh, how can, if not, how, what are the steps to, uh, I guess, amend public trust, whether or not the court itself actually does move back in a direction of impartiality? What, I mean, uh, there's a question of whether ever actually has been impartial, which is a separate thing. Um, but I'm, I'm talking purely just from the public perception, how do you move the public back okay. to a place where they trust the court? That, uh, uh that per the, the perception that judges are partisan uh, actors uh, is deeply damaging to the courts, and it's, it's grown. When I became a judge in 1985, if I were in the newspaper on something of public interest, it said, Judge Mark Wolf did this. Now it will always say, Judge Mark Wolf appointed by Ronald Reagan, as if you know that's going to predict uh, or dictate my behavior. I think, I thought for a while, uh, I, th I think the judicial nomination process uh, uh, contributes greatly to the impression that judges are politicians in robes. Uh, and it's become more, it's always been, there's a difference between, it's always been political. And, uh, but, you know, it, 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 President uh, Trump gave Leonard Leo, he said, here, give me a list. Uh, and, and judges were picked off the list. And then judges, uh, nominees uh, go before Congress. And, and the, the questioning is highly partisan. You know, they're trying to find how are you going to vote on reversing Roe versus Wade and the justices, including Justice Alito. So I, can't say anything about that. The case might come before me. Uh, but, you know, the nomination process does that. I, 
whether it's irreparable, time will tell. I think I'm going to spend the last as much time as I spent writing this talk, uh, if, if I th thought it was hopeless, and I think even if this is futile, uh, it's important to try. But I think, you know, it, it's also, it's young people who are, you, in a way you're gonna determine whether this is irreparable. You know, you're not a senator, you're not a powerful person, there's a lot of you. And, that, that's what I was saying. If, you know, just regular American people who are informed and concerned express that, and they can't fairly be written off as uh, just having a partisan interest. You want to get, I mean, it was very striking to me, a partisan interest. This is how much things have changed. I think it fits. So, President Lyndon Johnson, a Democrat, appointed his friend. Abe Fortas to the Supreme Court. Uh, by 1969, Richard Nixon, a Republican, was the president. Removing, you know, losing Abe Fortas on the Supreme Court would have caught, would, did cost the court a Democratic nominee. But there was bipartisan outrage at what he had done which in retrospects may appear modest compared to what's happened since. It was bipartisan outrage. Now, any concern that's expressed, based on my experience, uh, you know, is treated as a partisan issue, not a principled one about concern for the integrity of the court and whether it's enforcing the laws that Congress enacted that we take an oath to do when it comes to ourselves. In his lecture, uh, Judge Wolf uh, challenged the view that justices are uh, the, the necessity claim, right? Uh, the, and, um, but I think that on the issue of judiciary, on ethics and integrity of the judiciary, you've been a necessary player. I think you'll be looked back at as played a necessary condition in reforming how the courts think about ethics codes. Um, and so even though we can't give anything of material value to Judge Wolf, uh, we are allowed to uh, give him our tremendous gratitude for this lecture. Thank you so much, Judge Wolf. Thank you. Thank you very much.